Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Heffelfinger, and I'm a member of the board of the Minnesota Justice Research Center. I'm also a former two-time presidentially appointed United States attorney, and also a former assistant U.S. attorney and a former Hennepin, assistant Hennepin County attorney. Mm -hmm. And I have the honor today of chairing a panel of distinguished professionals to talk about the role of the prosecutor in matters involving alleged misconduct by public officials, uh, and specifically the role of the prosecutor in reaching out to the community and sharing what we've learned from our work in uh, prosecuting cases. Uh, prosecutorial function is central to all of the various uh, criminal justice systems in the United States, uh, federal, uh, state, local, and tribal. And we are pleased, we're honored to have with us um, folks who have served in all or many of those roles. Uh, John, John Choi, why don't you uh, lead off with introducing yourself briefly and we'll move through the panel quickly before we start to the questions. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you, Tom, uh, for uh, convening and moderating this panel. It's great to be on uh, this particular panel with my esteemed colleagues uh, to talk a little bit about um, the topics that we're going to discuss today. But I currently serve as the uh, elected Ramsey County attorney. I was first elected uh, in, uh, in December or uh, November of 2010 and took office in January of 2011. Prior to that, I was the St. Paul city attorney. Um, but uh, one of the things I want to just point out, too, as a part of how you frame this issue, I think one of the things that we, uh, as we think about reimagining the role of the prosecutor, uh, I think sometimes that we have to remind ourselves that we are very unique across uh, this uh, globe. Uh, we are the only nation on the planet that actually elects uh, its prosecutors. And so there's, a, I think, something uniquely American about that uh, and part of that role of the prosecutor is to ensure that we connect uh, with the values of our community. Don? Well, good morning. Uh, I am a lawyer in private practice, uh, co-founder of the Nyland Johnson Lewis Law Firm in, in downtown Minneapolis. In a uh, former life, I uh, served at the uh, Department of Justice in Washington and Civil Rights Division. Six years uh, working at the U.S. Attorney's Office as an assistant uh, U.S. Attorney with 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 Tom, uh, and uh, I've been a, a former uh, dean of a law school, and uh, have worked with uh, John Choi uh, a few years ago as the uh, special prosecutor in the Flando Castile case. So I have touched the legal system in many from many different directions, civilly, uh, criminally, government, private. Uh, private clients, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to this, this discussion. Uh, Drew Evans, why don't you go introduce yourself next? Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me uh, on the panel today. I'm Drew Evans, the superintendent at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Um, I've been in this role uh, since uh, uh, 2015. Um, serving that. And prior to that, I worked as an uh, agent um, supervisor in, in our homicide uh, section uh, across the BCA. For just a little bit of background, the BCA often is thought of as investigators. They're often up front, but we also have the state crime laboratory system that serves all uh, 87 counties in some respect, and the Minnesota Justice Information uh, Services, which is another a large division that we have, which incorporates all of the criminal justice records for the state of Minnesota that are housed on the law enforcement side. So I'm glad to be with you today. And finally, Mark Osler. Yeah, it's great to be here. I'm Mark Osler. I'm the Robert and Marion Short Chair of Law here at the University of St. Thomas. I was a federal prosecutor in Detroit from 1995 to 2000. And then from 2000 to 2010, I taught criminal law at Baylor University down in Waco, Texas. And I've been here since 2010. So I've had the opportunity to see three very different places, uh, Detroit, Waco, and now here in the Twin Cities um, in terms of criminal law and prosecution. Mark, let's get started with you. Um, uh, I want you to, to address, if you wouldn't mind, in discussing the role of the prosecutor uh, in it, 
his or her interactions with the community and with the police. I'd like you to discuss the role of legal ethics, specifically prosecutorial ethics, as the prosecutor must apply on a daily basis to uh, interaction with the community and the police. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because um, when we talk about the problems that arise with interactions between prosecutors and police, particularly when there's uh, law enforcement officers who are being investigated, the way we usually look at ethics in this field flips upside down because most of our ethical rules regarding prosecutors are meant to temper over aggression. Um, you know, for example, the first rule in 3.8 in the Minnesota rules is that a prosecutor should refrain from prosecuting a charge that the prosecutor knows is not supported by probable cause. But there's no um, uh, similar ethical rule that says that you should charge when there's probable cause. In fact, the ethical rules maintain a broad range of discretion for prosecutors and how to guide an investigation and how to uh, how to charge. And so, you know, we see here something where we've got the set of ethical rules that we usually look to that don't directly address the problems that the community raises with prosecutors, particularly in charging police, which is that uh, they too rarely charge the police or take that investigation seriously. Uh, really what we're talking about isn't so much the ethical rules that come into play, but the constitutional and the political duty to treat people equally. That is to investigate and to charge law enforcement in the same way uh, while taking into account their role and some of the special rules that apply to them, uh, law enforcement officers who have done harm to the community. Um, it's, there's that ethical obligation that really isn't a part of the ethical rules, but derives more from that general mandate to protect the community is really important. And it's notable that instead of seeing these cases um, where prosecutors have been alleged to have not been aggressive enough in, in pursuing law enforcement, we don't see it coming up in terms of any kind of justifiable ethics complaint. Rather, the corrective is political. And we've seen that across the country. One of the things that's driven the movement towards progressive prosecutors who have won in places like Chicago, Philadelphia, San Francisco, has been the idea that they are going to be more equitable in the way that they treat law enforcement when they're under investigation and under charge. John, your office, has uh, a reputation for a lot of outreach into the community. You've also prosecuted your office very recently, a, a fairly prominent uh, case involving uh, Philando Castile as a victim. Uh, how have you applied these standards as Marx laid them out, both ethical standards and political standards, if you will, uh, for your interaction with the community and in those kinds of cases? Yeah, and I think, <clears throat> Thanks for that question. And, and Mark, thanks for kind of uh, framing that because I think it's so important to understand that it's not just solely like an ethical issue. I think at times prosecutors have actually abused uh, the ethical standards and used it to uh, maybe justify things that are uh, convenient for the prosecutor. I wanna say that out loud because that's what we have to be mindful of is to recognize that distinction uh, between when ethics truly are in play and when uh, we need to be thinking about like inherent biases that might exist about the role of a prosecutor to be independent. Uh, I think that's one of the most critical things is to view this job uh, that you have. And I'm not just talking about elected uh, prosecutors around the country, but it's to recognize that we have to maintain uh, this really important independent role and there are things that we have to do as a part of our job uh, that will require us to work with other people. And it requires us to develop relationships. It requires us to be present, uh, whether it's with the community or with um, uh, maybe uh, working with police or whatever it might be. 
we have to be present. We have to invest in those relationships, but we have to recognize our role too to be also independent uh, from the, the the political whims of, uh, of maybe a, a situation happening in your community. At the same time, uh, the things that can happen as it relates to when you don't see um, uh, things that need to be corrected for maybe within policing. And so it's so critical for the prosecutor, I think, to embrace that role of independence uh, and at the same time to recognize that um, when we're talking about these ethical standards, the, the probable cause standard is very, very, very low. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, the, the question is just, do you believe that there's a reasonable likelihood of success at, at trial, right? And if you think about that, I mean, what does that actually mean and how do you kind of have that conversation. We actually did as a part of uh, the case uh, involving uh, the death of Philando Castile. And it was an interesting conversation, but at the end of the day, if people were saying that, well, this is a hard case, or this is, how would, how do we prove this? Uh, we're also including some notion of jury nullification as well. And we have to recognize the moment that we're in where it's, of course, it's gonna be a, 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 a challenging case to prove because, uh, we're really asking the world to view upside down and apply the law to the facts where they normally wouldn't have that type of experience. Now today in 2020, uh, I think the, the worldview is starting to change a little bit where people are recognizing that it is possible or it should be that if a police officer shoots somebody, even if they're in the line of duty and they were there thinking that they uh, were there to protect the public that they could actually be in violation of a criminal law. I'd like to follow up, John, on one of the points you made by asking Drew a question. You talked about independence. You also talked about the need for working with a variety of stakeholders, including police. Obviously, one of the ethical issues that guides all lawyers, including prosecutors, is conflicts of interest and pretty hard to... Uh, work with a police agency if in fact you're investigating that very same agency or officers in that same agency. So I'd like to address, ask Drew to address the role of uh, investigators in ensuring that uh, there are no conflicts of interest, that they are able to establish and maintain independence. And Drew, I'm gonna ask you to throw one other thing into your answer. We uh, understand that this July, the legislature passed special legislation that gave your agency responsibility for prosecuting cases involving uh, homicides committed by police. If you could address that addition to your responsibilities and how you are implementing that even in the last uh, four or five months. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. It's a really good question. And the BCA for a very long time has investigated um, uh, what exactly what you call them. We call them internally a conflict of interest investigations where a public official, police officer, um, high ranking government official is accused of some sort of crime and that is designed so that it is an independent agency. The BCA is an independent law enforcement agency uh, that covers all 87 counties with the same power of sheriff in those counties. And so that's um, the, the jurisdiction that we would have at the request of the jurisdiction to do those investigations. Our agents, depending on the situation, are often, because we have a statewide uh, 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 focus, that often we will take agents from different areas of the state to avoid relationships that may exist as uh, you know the prosecutor, John Choi, noted, uh, you know, the agents are working with local jurisdictions on different types of cases that we do provide service on. And so it's very important that we make sure there is no um, conflict of interest for our agents in investigating. And one of the things that I would just say for everybody to begin with, that I think is become an increasing focus that we need to be very cognizant of to avoid the bias or a conflict of interest is that if the community does not believe that they are doing it truly independent and we are operating independent without bias, it really does nobody any good in that process. The community doesn't trust the investigation. They don't trust the prosecutorial decision that um, is occurring. It can be the same for the law enforcement agency. It can be the same for the, the leaders of that community, which leads to the unrest that we've seen associated with some of 
on the cases we've seen, not just in our community, but all across the United States. So what was created as part of that, which we fully supported at the BCA when the legislature moved forward is to create a wholly independent unit that will focus on use of force investigations, criminal sexual conduct allegations against peace officers, and um, the conflict of interest investigations will go to that unit. They're already taking some of those right now. We're in the process of forming that unit right now, and we are very careful and intentional, even internally. We're in the process of actually having a conflict of interest policy put into place so that there's a process we go through to ensure that agents are conflicted out of case, much like a law firm would conflict out lawyers if they have a, you know, establish a relationship with somebody going forward. And then in addition, that unit will not work on other types of cases. They're actually gonna be housed even at our headquarters. We've identified space that's outside of our traditional investigative um, investigations division here at the BCA so that they're truly independent in terms of uh, what types of cases they're working on. And part of that was, is that we'll identify agents that will go into that with the experience, background, um, et cetera, but to eliminate any perception that exactly as you noted, uh, Tom, that yet this week we are working um, on a homicide with that agency and the next week we're in investigating, you know, the same people for being involved in a use of force incident. This will be a unit that will be having the oversight to those investigations working then directly um, with uh, the county attorneys in all 87 counties across Minnesota. And so that unit, uh, we're actually in the process, will fill some, some internal positions internally, um, but also in terms of trying to ensure that the community really um, can trust that we took a very holistic view of this new unit. Um, half of those, uh, at least half of those investigators uh, will be new hires from the outside that we're identifying right now. And we're actually, I just had a conversation this morning with my deputy superintendent of investigations. We're even taking a slightly different approach in our hiring, including people with a different lens, including people like our new community victim and family services liaison, who will be there helping us identify which agents really are the best fit for that unit to make sure that they're very um, community focused in terms of their approach uh, to these types of investigations. Don Lewis, um, you were a great prosecutor and as a result in your private world now you have been called upon several times to serve as a special prosecutor. Uh, in, in one case John mentioned uh, where there was a pending litigation but also in conducting investigations. Can you explain how that has worked and why you found yourself in situations uh, providing special prosecution services? Well, you know, uh, John Choi is probably in the best position to, to, to explain why he might have brought me in. But, but uh, from my, my perspective, and I think this builds on uh, Drew's comments a moment ago, you can build as best you can, a structure that avoids conflict of interest, but it is meaningless if the public doesn't trust it. And, um, you know, I was brought in, the, the Philando Castile shooting was in uh, July of 2016. Uh, it was a much, it, it was a very difficult time because uh, I think in the preceding year, uh, uh, police-involved shootings around the country had peaked. And there were hardly any uh, convictions. And you will recall also in Minneapolis, we were uh, just uh, uh, completing the controversy over the Jamal Clark uh, decision not to, not to prosecute. And I think the, the public had uh, a lot of cynicism and skepticism about uh, in the event when Philando Castile was, was killed as to whether or not there would be a, 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 a neutral uh, decision. And um, so I viewed my role as one of bringing um, uh, someone in a detached perspective, uh, a, a perspective unencumbered by, by potential conflict of interest, um, to see if I could uh, add some level of trust to the decision making uh, that was uh, involved in, in making the prosecution decision. Uh, and also bring in, you know, some expertise in assisting the county and in in, um, in uh, handling and uh, looking at the uh, expert witnesses that might support its uh, it, its decision. And the way it was structured, if you will recall, 
was that I was in a role of an, an, an advisory role, an assisting role of, of bringing a new perspective and, and of, avoiding potential conflicts. But the, the, the key part of the, the structure was that John was going to have the final decision because John was the elected county attorney and somebody had to be accountable for whatever decision was being made. And John very uh, uh, early uh, assumed that role himself. Um, so uh, uh, that I think is the central role is to, for, for an independent uh, prosecutors to bring a level of, of trust and confidence uh, for the public in the, in the decision-making process. John, can you follow up on Don's comments? Uh, yeah, first absolutely. Of all, um, and I think one more thing about wanting to have Don uh, be a part of the team um, was uh, the background that he had with the Department of Justice, uh, working in the Civil Rights Division early on in his career. But just that perspective of looking at uh, this issue from that perspective, I think was also very valuable. But as Don mentioned, uh, he was a valued part of the team to kind of help get to a decision. But I think with Don's outside uh, perspective, is you know, when you're in the office, uh, you know, we have done things a certain way forever, right? And we think about things in a certain way. And I think we get into certain patterns of how we process and evaluate evidence and how we think about a lot of the things that happen that are presented to us, you know, in terms of actual, like how we process uh, the truth, right? I think having Don's perspective at the table uh, that wasn't wedded to those processes or those particular patterns uh, and was actually coming from the outside uh, it was very, very helpful. Uh, I think in addition to uh, Don's assistance, I also believe that uh, the involvement of the United States Attorney's Office uh, in our case was also uh, wonderful. I mean, I, I just think that because of the fact that uh, the federal government has had, had so much experience in officer accountability types of investigations, uh, that was very, very helpful. And so uh, credit also should go to uh, a former United States Attorney Andy Luger uh, who was a part of making that happen and uh, sending over an assistant United States attorney. But having all of those different perspectives, I think really helped us get to that decision. Uh, and I, in, in my heart, I know that was the right decision to charge the case, uh, to do everything, how we handled it. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of what I would say about that. And so I'm very grateful to Dan's involvement, the great, the, the involvement of, uh, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, the Attorney's Office and the federal government as well. Before we go on to a related question uh, regarding the community, there was a question that came in that I think is really directed at Drew. The, uh, the, the, the attendee was, found what you're doing there interesting. And we also heard yesterday from Representative Marinari about the, uh, the, the bill this summer. The question was, it's an interesting what the BCA is doing, but the question is whether other states have developed similar independent investigation and or prosecution units to deal with uh, police misconduct or public misconduct. I can handle the investigative piece. So I am actually currently the vice chair of the Association of State Criminal Investigative Agencies. And part of that role is I chair a committee on use of force investigations. 49 of the 50 states have of some level of equivalent to the BCA in their states. And so we talk a lot about these issues. Some states have uh, units, Florida, for example, has a unit that focuses on conflict of interest, um, public corruption, a number of different things. To my knowledge, this is the first state that's focused a specific unit that focuses on use of force investigations, criminal sexual conduct, the way we are. But there's some level of it in different places. The inflection point um, was that we've been discussing how to do this last summer, myself and a number of our uh, agents uh, uh, in a management uh, spent time in a number of different states across the United States trying to look for best practices as part of a continuous improvement plan to make sure we're doing everything we can to follow best practices for investigations. 
some of this was a discussion that we were having internally, but then part of that came out of our, the Deadly Force um, Encounters Working Group is where this really uh, gained some steam that was headed by Commissioner John Harrington and Attorney General Keith Ellison. The panel really wanted to focus on the independence and unbiased nature of trying to create that unit. And through discussions that were had, there was a, 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 a consensus that there needed to be a, a level of expertise in death investigation, conducting these investigations statewide, crime scene, laboratory. And so the BCA made some sense, but to provide a really significant level of independence is to really cordon off the unit that we came up with. And so that uh, was the recommendation that came out of that group. And as you uh, heard from Chair Mariani, it was uh, uh, definitely something that the legislature believed would be a best practice for our state moving forward. Uh, John might be able to comment. There are a couple states that have independent um, units. New York Attorney General's Office, for example, um, is an independent uh, investigator examining these cases. And that's the one I'm familiar with, but uh, Attorney Gen uh, County Attorney Choi might have more. John, um, you can address that, but I'd also like you to start on an issue that's of great importance to all of our audience, uh, as well as to uh, you and those of us who've practiced as prosecutors in the past, and that is the relationship with the community. You're not only an elected official, you also represent all of those people that live in Ramsey County who are witnesses or victims or potential defendants. Um, can you explain to us how you are able to take what you've learned from the prosecution of cases, which are always sad. Uh, there's always some, somebody has made a mistake or somebody has been victimized, but how do you take what you've learned and take it into the community uh, to establish both outreach before or after an incident, uh, to uh, gather the public's support and answer the public's questions? Yeah, thanks, Tom. I'll, I'll try to address that question. But uh, as Drew had talked a little bit about, um, I think the uh, also thinking about that conflict or that independent role of the prosecutor in terms of how we would set up a structure like this, one of the things that certainly is a proposal in Minnesota that everybody uh, listening to this should be thinking about is whether or not it would be better. I think it would be to have one particular prosecution agency centralized in the state uh, to handle uh, the cases that might originate or come from the, the special unit that's at the BCA. So we've created a special investigative unit, but I think something could be said that perhaps a centralized um, prosecution function uh, that would be uh, removed from any type of perceived conflict uh, could also be a better thing. The proposal would be in the attorney general's office, but there's other ways to think about it. But as long as it's already if it's developed as a part of a, a, a law, a legal proposal, and it's in statute, I think that could be far better than the current framework that we have now, where you've got, you know, 87 different county attorneys uh, who mm. might come up with arrangements to share their cases with other people to avoid conflicts. But it just, I think there's a, we should have similar standards across the state about how we think about these cases. And of course, someone needs to be held accountable there should be some way that you know there's an elected person that would be involved with uh, whether people liked or didn't like what was happening. Now, okay. uh, Tom, you raised the, yeah the important issue about connecting to the community, and I think that the role of the prosecutor. Uh, I think sometimes we can become so insular, and we become uh, thinking about ourselves and the work that we do as a big part of this, this the, the system or the, the, this important role that we have in this assembly line. And it's a really important role. We're kind of like the gatekeeper. And it's our job to ensure that, uh, you know, injustice doesn't happen by us not being at the door to make sure that something, that someone who's innocent isn't prosecuted uh, <clears throat> with a crime or that we, but we also have to recognize that we got to think about who isn't on the assembly line, right? And so for a long time, we've had uh, the victims of sexual assault who I think uh, who weren't on that assembly line because they didn't raise their hand or uh, in this particular issue, holding uh, people who are uh, asked to uphold the law like law enforcement, that they need to be on that assembly line. So that prosecutor has that really important role guided by ethics and all of that to play that part. 
But I also think there's another important piece of this, and you're never going to do your job well uh, as a part of being a minister of justice if you're not connected to the values of uh, a community. That's ultimately when I tell people about what I do, I say it's my job to ensure that the values of a community, my community, are reflected in the work and the decisions that happen within my office and also within the justice system. So I think it's so critical that um, as we think about this type of work, that we develop a relationship before any of these situations happen. If we're scrambling to try to uh, develop processes and procedures and develop and communicate uh, when, after an incident has occurred, it's too late. And I think it's so important that a prosecutor, and this is the important part, it's not just about like being with community. I think I used to be a prosecutor that said, well, it's my job to go out and educate the public and tell them what we do. And I've come to believe that that is the, actually the wrong approach. Uh, the right approach is actually to be with community, to learn from them, uh, to be informed by kind of how the justice system has impacted them. In fact, we have a greater and greater uh, numbers of people in our community who have been negatively impacted by the justice system. And so in order for us to do this the right way, we have to embrace this notion that we can learn so much from those individuals that have been in some ways impacted by uh, the things that we do. And so I've learned a lot by developing a relationship with uh, Valerie and Clarence, uh, more so after the uh, Philando's death, but um, I also realized that I had a relationship with Philando Castillo and I didn't even know it. And what that was, was that before uh, he had been killed, I had created a driver diversion program that allowed him to have a license and get his license back because he uh, was in a situation where he had lost his license. His mother, Valerie, knew that. That was one of the reasons why we were able to develop some trust. Early on, uh, one of the most uh, poignant things that have happened in my life after the trial, you know, Valerie actually gave me a copy of the, the, the graduation certificate. I still have it in my office uh, when he graduated from that diversion program, but it's having that relationship beforehand. And also I would encourage all uh, people who investigate these uh, incidents and prosecutors who are involved with officer involved fatalities uh, to develop relationship, because uh, we already have relationship with police, but to develop relationship with those um, families that have been victimized by police violence. I, I think we will learn so much about their perspectives, how they have been treated, not just here locally in Minnesota, but across the nation. That's one of the great privileges that I've had. And I try to uh, use that knowledge uh, into the work that we're doing. John, you made a good point about uh, the difference between educating the public and listening to the public. And in the, this area of uh, police involved uh, violence, uh, shootings in particular, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying about reaching out to the family of the victim and getting their perspective. But uh, that's, again, that is after the fact. And I, I would ask you to, to address what are there ways of listening to the public in advance of such an incident that might help set it, help, might help avoid it, or at least might help engage the public more in the process of accountability and working with the police and working with prosecutors and being heard? In other words, in, in listening in advance. Right. And it's not just about listening. I think it's also about having meaningful ways in which you incorporate citizen uh, oversight into the work that you do. Um, I think this whole thing about uh, defund police, uh, it's become very controversial, but I think there's something there that everybody should be listening to. It's not about defunding police. It's what it is, is that this concept that uh, the public, policing is ours, meaning that we should have civilian involvement and oversight in how we think about training, how we think about use of force policies, how a prosecutor shows up and does their work and how they might process a certain particular 
situation, all of that, we should involve the public in that type of work. And it's not, it's no more, I think, where I think you're doing good when you go into a closet and you come up with some sort of reform on your own and you come out and you just start doing it. I th think the key is to involve the community uh, in a lot of the things that are happening in terms of how we might react to a situation when it should happen uh, in the future. So in other words, what I'm suggesting is, is that um, there's value in actually not just listening to the community, but to actually engage them and have them uh, be at the table as we talk about and think about uh, like how we might process a future officer involved uh, fatality case or how we might develop use of force in a jurisdiction, how we do training. I think all of that belongs to the people. It's actually a very scary thought to, to reflect back a little bit and to think about how Graham versus Connor, which is the, the, the tenant of all training, it's the basis, the foundation for all police training in America. And it, the, how we interpreted that case and how it became a part of like training protocols you know, the public really was never engaged in any of that until much, much more recently. Um, I hope one day that the United States Supreme Court uh, will take up Graham versus Connor again and revisit uh, kind of the state of affairs of kind of how that particular case, which, by the way, was a case involving uh, somebody who stole orange juice uh, <laughs> from a supermarket. And they were talking about uh, the continuum of force. Uh, but in that are in that opinion, there's lots of things that are applicable to these situations. Uh, but I think we need to be thinking about it from the lens of uh, the, the people, the people of America. Tom, can I follow up on that? Just Absolutely, Mark. And a couple of weeks ago, I got an invitation from a couple of community groups that asked me to come down to give a talk in George Floyd Square, actually at the abandoned Speedway gas station down there. Um, outside. And what they wanted me to come talk about was the grand jury and how the grand jury works. And um, I know, John, that you are remarkable in the way that you engage with community groups. And what fascinated me about this was how interested and knowledgeable the people in that community were about this issue. That we have a moment right now where we can have these discussions at a fairly high level, not just amongst lawyers and academics, but with the people who are directly affected um, because this is what people are talking about and this is what they're learning about. And we need to seize that opportunity. Yeah, um, um, can go I, ahead, Don. Can I jump in on this? I, I just wanted to make the comment that, um, and maybe this comes from my, my healthcare background, is that, you know, you can't, can't build a healthcare system around ambulances and hospitals. And the analogy in the criminal justice system is that you cannot build a criminal justice system simply around courtrooms uh, and, and, and prisons. So I think this aspect of, and I think way back, maybe 20, 30 years ago, they, 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 they talked about it in terms of the community prosecution movement this notion of engaging uh, people who are affected by crime. And, um, and, and it's amazing, you know, when you talk to people in a community, what they worry about the most, uh, very, very, very small things. And I think it's, you know, the initiatives that matter are those that address the social determinants of entry into the criminal justice system, uh, because you know, crime is for many people an economic decision and it's driven by, by poverty and, and lack of education and, and, and you know, concentration of, of racial communities. And, the, and we have many ideas, the, the problem, you know, we have many ideas how to address this. The problem is that we have lacked the political will. Um, and it's, for example, and, and, you know, Minnesota is fortunate that we, we have, you know, enlightened, uh, prosecutors in, 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 our, in our major counties. Uh, but that's not the case around the country. 
And when you know uh, you you saw in this election cycle the 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 again the emergence of law and order um, uh, campaign strategies, uh, it all rests in in the point that I, I think John made at the very beginning. In the United States, we have prosecutors who are elected officials and uh, who are accountable to the to to the public. And I think they need to exercise political courage to address some of the, in the uh, some of the inequities in our system. Drew, you uh, wanted to uh, address the recruitment issue that, that was brought up earlier. Yeah, I just, uh, in the interest of time, I put an answer there. I'm happy to answer uh, additional questions. One thing that I, I will just leave it at this is we got that, five minutes. Yeah, is that Actually, we, we got well, ten minutes. We, we, and, I, and I'll just leave it at this. Our goal always for all of our investigations division is to be reflective of the state of Minnesota and we're continuously working towards that goal. And that's absolutely going to be of high importance for us as we select this unit. Mark, I'd like you to talk a little bit about your role as teaching young lawyers. And these are men and women who, uh, because they're taking your courses in criminal law, I'd like you to address that group. But these are men and women who uh, have an interest, at least, in becoming prosecutors or defense lawyers. Um, as you teach them, how do you address, I'm, I'm certain you do the ethics discussion, but how do you address the issue of outreaching to the community? These are men and women who will become uh, public service lawyers. And uh, among their clients is the general public. How do you try to build that into your education? Yeah, I mean, part of it is we have to start by um, untraining them in some bad ideas. Uh, and, and one of them is that the prosecutor's client is the police. Um, and sometimes there's the thought that the prosecutor's client is the victim. Uh, there's the sense that discretion should be exercised and that you prosecute everything that is a uh, violation of the law. And, and so a big part of the challenge, Tom, is to, to start by opening up their minds to what really goes on to, so that they can be the kind of prosecutor that Don is talking about or that John is, um, as opposed to something that's simple. And, and that's, that's the biggest thing is that um, too often there's this sense that what we do in law enforcement is simple and it's not. If it's simple, we're doing it wrong. If it's complicated and it's human and it's messy and we're engaged in it, it's tiring and it's exhausting, but it's also the only way it can be done in a principled, meaningful way. And, and that's, that's part of what we have to train people in too, is how to, how to sustain yourself while doing this the right way, while engaging in the tragedy that criminal law is. Because it's all tragedy. We can't change that. The best we can do is try to prevent tragedy in the future. And that's where the public engagement comes in. That engagement with um, the people in the community, not just after crime, not just during the prosecution, but in the ways that, that John and Don have talked about before that as well. John, I'd like to raise an issue that came up in uh, the Philando Castile case that has come up in uh, the uh, George Floyd case, and that's the issue of the timing of a decision. Obviously, every prosecutor who knows his or her business knows that eventually they have to make a decision, whether that's to make a decision to charge themselves to make the decision or to put it in front of a grand jury, but you have to make a decision. The real issue that has arisen in recent cases uh, is the timing of that decision. Is it a decision where you rush to make a decision just simply so that the public will know that a decision is being made? Or do you move slowly and deliberately in order to uh, have all your, your ducks in a row, so to speak? And, and could you address sort of that timing as it gets to both, and, and the, Drew, this also applies to you, goes to the investigative phase of a case, as well as the charging phase, and then ultimately the trial. So yeah, I'd be happy to. I think that one of the things we have to recognize is that 
every case is going to be somewhat, there's going to be some nuance or be difference. Uh, the things that surround the case, I'm not talking about just the facts of the case, but I'm talking about uh, the, 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 the set of situations that surround uh, what just happened, right? So I think um, we have to be open to the reality that there's got to be some notion of flexibility, but we also have to stand firm on this notion uh, that an investigation should be thorough and complete. Uh, it would be uh, a bad thing, a really bad thing, if any prosecutor in the state of Minnesota uh, would make a decision uh, before uh, they had sufficient evidence to make that particular decision. So BCA investigations typically historically have taken time, but over time, they've actually become a lot faster. At, and actually, as they're putting more resources into this, I also noticed that it's uh, they're like every you know, every time we get a new case, it, they're, they're quicker at their turnaround, right? So that's with respect to a complete investigation. I also think that there can be where, you know, now we develop uh, processes where it's not like the BCA does their work and then all of a sudden after like six months, here it is. Uh, we're actually getting bits and pieces of the case like on a daily basis and they're having conversations. So during that time period, even early on, I think there could be the possibility that certainly you have enough information and evidence to have probable cause to make a charging decision. Uh, maybe not so much to, to not make a charging decision or to decline the case. You probably need to have the benefit of the entire investigation so that you know that you've looked into everything. But when it comes to charging, I think there's, it depends. It all depends on how much <clears throat> information is done, but it's a bad thing if the prosecutor is racing out ahead and uh, maybe making a charging decision before uh, critical pieces of information uh, are gathered by the DC. I think another piece of this too is if you hurry, uh, you could actually negatively impact the integrity of the case because if uh, some, something becomes public as part of the investigation and there are not all of the witnesses have been interviewed, uh, that could skew how somebody might respond to being questioned uh, as a part of a subsequent interview or on the stand. And ultimately, I think everybody would agree, our job is to try to get to the truth of what happened and so having uh, some modicum of that truth, uh, I think the, how we think about the early stages of an investigation are really, really critical. So I don't know, I'm trying to talk about investigations, but I don't know, maybe Drew wants to talk about that. Yeah, sure, quickly, a, a, a couple of things that, that we have done just to, to really help this um, along. One is that, um, uh, you know, and part of the reason that it happened, just to even back up, is that traditionally a law enforcement agency gets a case of any type, they fully investigate it, and then the prosecutor reviews it once you've completed your investigation at a point where you think charging uh, decisions should be, should be examined. What we've done is to try to help with that process is a couple of things. One, we've given a target for all of our agents to have investigations completed within 60 days. That target is not a hard target, but what it does do is that we also have our supervisors then actively managing, reviewing, and that we surge resources in and out of the investigation so that we can meet those deadlines. And then the other piece of that to try to keep to that is that we're early working um, with the prosecutor. So we require our agents to be uh, making contact within 24 hours, usually in the big offices like John's and, and uh, you know, Hennepin County, we're talking to them that night um, or that right as the incident's occurring so that any kind of uh, nuanced uh, differences to the investigation that are slightly out of the ordinary, we can have that conversation so we gather evidence quickly that may not be within our normal uh, sets of protocol so that we're not having to do that after they've done a full review of the case and then we're regularly meeting with those prosecutors as is going on. All that has made a, uh, the ability to do that more quickly, but I agree with um, 
County Attorney Choi that we also have to have the space so that we do it right. And so if we have the full examination by the prosecutors in the case, that there's a time where we may need to go and gather additional evidence. That's a normal investigative process and we need to do that. So we really, at the end of the day, the goal of the BCA is always to seek the truth as to what occurred. And then the county attorney applies that truth to the law to make a charging decision at the, the right time. And so it's a matter of trying to do it quickly, but to make sure we're doing it correctly as well. Gentlemen, we have time for one sort of key question from uh, Sarah Davis. Uh, I'm gonna direct this to John because I think it's <coughs> the most appropriate. Uh, the question ultimately comes to the following. What are you doing to ensure that prosecutors in your office are using their discretion in a way that promotes building trust with the community and sharing power with the community? Well, there's a, there's a long answer for that because there's so many things that we're doing, but I think the, this notion of discretion is a really important thing that I think people who work in the executive branch of government need to better understand. Um, so it's just because the, uh, we police in a certain way and they present cases to our office um, and then the, the traditional notion is, is that, well, then we should, because a case has been investigated, we should prosecute it. I think prosecutors have to stop being the rubber stamp for what happens uh, with respect to how policing happens. And we need to think uh, thoroughly about what it is that we're charging in terms of letting in uh, the door. Uh, we actually employ that in many other uh, aspects of uh, the work that we do. So I think we just, uh, that piece of it is really important. I also wish that police would embrace this notion that they too have discretion about what they should be doing in terms of enforcing the law. Uh, and then in terms of the, the work that we do to kind of share power, to co do co-design, I, I think yesterday, uh, 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 there was somebody speaking about some of the work that we're doing to reimagine justice for youth, where we're creating tables, where we're actually doing co-design uh, to transform kind of what we do in terms of how we might think about making a charging decision. Uh, it's been said and it's been developed over time without question that somehow this is a sole province of the prosecutor and that the police provide the set of facts upon which we make that decision. I actually believe that there are more facts that could be put to the table to better understand, not just the situation, to better understand the person who stands accused of a particular situation or crime. That if we knew more about this particular person working in conjunction with the public defender working in conjunction with community perspective, that we could actually have better decisions around public safety and justice. And so we're building a, a way to start thinking about doing a collaborative review of situations that come to our office so that the prosecutor's decision uh, is shared. And it's actually uh, uh, informed uh, by a broader perspective. So I'm really excited about that. That's just one example. There's a lots of other things that we're uh, working on to uh, co-design, share power with our community and to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on uh, justice, that justice belongs to the people. And so we should incorporate uh, a broader perspective as we think about how we do our work and how we actually do it. Thank There's you, John. There, I'm, uh, not enough time to get into that. We are, we have one minute left. <laughs> I'm going to just, I'm going to preempt all of you. I'm giving the, uh, the county attorney got the final argument. Uh, and I, I want to uh, express my appreciation and the appreciation of the Minnesota Justice Research Center to the four of you for joining us. This was a, uh, uh, as I said at the outset, there isn't any involvement in the criminal justice system that does not involve uh, the prosecutor's office. Uh, and the investigator's office. And I appreciate that we were lucky enough to get uh, four individuals, all of whom have high experience and all of whom represent the best of the business. Uh, and especially uh, pleased with uh, uh, County Attorney Choi and with uh, Special Assistant County Attorney Lewis, who took that, uh, the, 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 the sadness of the Castile case 
and tried to include the public in the decision making and in in making your decisions as prosecutors, recognizing the interest of the public. Uh, anything that any of the four of you feel must be said before we uh, tee it off? Thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. your, uh, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Those of you who are watching it and want CLE credits, you need to go to the chat room and find the link for the documents. Uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.